Let's react to TLC show Extreme Cheapskates. I don't really like the title and some of these are actually quite unhealthy, but some actually make some sense. Huge thanks to ButcherBox for sponsoring this video. Let's get started. Be whoop. I'm going to be making a lasagna. By any chance, if you have any other ground beef that's already left over. It's all sold. We sell it on a daily basis, fresh all the time. Okay, and so there's nothing that would expire? Oh, no, man. We don't, to expire. No, man. We don't sell expired product here. You don't want to sell expired beef because expired beef will literally have listeria, E. coli, all sorts of bacteria in it that can cause a really serious colitis, requiring IV antibiotics, requiring a hospital stay, possibly a surgery, a colectomy where you're cutting out pieces of your intestine. Like, you don't want that. How much would two pounds of this book? the beef fat beef. $2.53, ma'am. I will take the beef fat. So instead of using protein, she's just using the beef fat? By supplementing the meat with the beef fat, Stephanie saved 75% on the ingredients for her lasagna. But then you're changing the nutritional makeup of the food completely. Like when you go to a store and you buy 80% ground beef, that means it's 80% lean and 20% fat. Here, now you've changed the proportions to be like the other way, like 20% protein and 80% fat. That's that's terribly unhealthy. Like probably the unhealthiest thing you can do to the food. Like red meat on its own already has some troubles when you overeat it and then you create heart disease. This is like quadrupling that problem. Now to save money, I multitask with washing dishes and cooking meals with my dishwasher. Oh, no. I just gotta make sure I wrap it really well or else the food will get wet. With the dishwasher reaching a temperature of 170 degrees, the lasagna will be fully cooked in one and a half hours. No, because you don't know if the temperature is like that all across, unlike an oven where it's controlled. The pennies that you're saving here will pale in comparison to the one time that you get sick and your hospital bills are out of control. That's why I'm trying to say that it's not that I'm judging this process. It's just not a practical process, not a healthy process. Ideally, this should be changed. Yeah, it's good, right? To be cooked in a yeah. dishwasher? The lime tastes like water. Yeah, and the kid rightfully said no. If I had a patient that was doing that, I would seriously discuss whether or not we can change that. And if the patient was not receptive to it, there may be a conversation about getting some people involved to go check on the welfare of those children. I go dumpster diving in the trash of upscale grocery stores in New York. These stores often throw away a lot of very high quality foods. Yeah, I've heard that. Including organic foods and really nice prepared foods. And there's a lot of these stores in New York that have relationships with food banks so that they don't make waste of this food and they can feed our homeless population in New York. Just what they don't want to have happen is constantly people just waiting outside of their restaurants because then it creates a pattern where then it, it might demotivate some individuals from actually uh, going to a shelter, seeking refuge, getting the proper help that they might need, etc. I'm guessing these tomatoes got thrown out probably because they were among a bunch that had maybe one or two that were spoiled. So often the store would just throw the whole batch out. It's not like bread when there's a piece of mold in the, any part of the bread, you gotta throw the whole thing out. With tomatoes or berries, you could just get rid of the ones that have mold on them. There is a chicken asparagus with two sides here. My friends might like this, even though I don't like chicken. This is dated today. What is it? Uh, these are some the vegetables with uh, turkey and chicken, mashed potatoes. And then this is a chicken fried rice. So everything's in the same pot? Turkey. Yeah, this is a medley. I actually like eating foods in a medley, and my friends make fun of me of it. They're like, Mike, you're eating at a ho horse trough. But I like it that way. That's why I get Chipotle burrito balls. <laughs> they didn't seem too fond of it, but that has nothing to do with her saving money. She's just not a good cook. If my friends came over and asked me to cook for them, they'd probably make the same face. While pulling expired sandwiches out of a grocery store garbage bag might be affordable, I don't think you should ever cut corners when it comes to eating a healthy and safe diet, which is why for the last year, I've made sure to get so many of my ingredients from ButcherBox. They deliver fresh, certified organic chicken, wild-caught seafood, and grass-fed beef right to my front door. This saves me so much time and gives me peace of mind every month knowing that I'm getting the highest quality meats. I don't have to get in my car, drive to the grocery store, park, push around a shopping cart, and then lug everything back Back home. Having the food brought right to my doorstep just means I get to eat sooner and easier. Recently, I've been enjoying their wild-caught Alaskan sockeye salmon, which is not only delicious, but packed full of nutrients. It's seriously so good. ButcherBox practices thoughtful sourcing when it comes to selecting their products too, which means that I can trust their high-quality food is better for me, the farmers, the animals' welfare, and our 
planet. They're super flexible with what you can get in your box too. And if you're looking for a more affordable option, their cheapest box actually has enough food for 24 meals, meaning you and your family can have a home cooked meal five nights a week for an entire month and then some. You can choose your delivery frequency too, so you get exactly the foods you and your family love all in an eco-friendly, 100% recyclable box. Not to mention, shipping is always free. I think that's a pretty good deal. Click the link below to claim this month's exclusive limited time offer for ButcherBox plus free shipping when you use my link. All right, let's get back to the show. In the past six years, Mark has volunteered in more than 100 medical studies and the riskier the trial, the better it pays. Well, actually, I'm not gonna even say that this is a bad thing because we need more volunteers for our research. Two studies that I'm waiting on that I have not been in yet is a flatline study. This is a really good one. What they do is they stop your heart for one minute, but you still breathe. Stay there 14 days, pays $25,000 but the FDA kind of stepped in and stopped that. Whoa, you flatline for a minute and they keep you breathing and then bring back your pulse through epinephrine? My God, I don't, I can't even imagine. The second one that I'm really anxious and really excited and waiting to do, what you do is you go in and you donate one of your testicles, they replace it with an artificial one, and when you check out after 14 days, you get a check for $35,000. That's an expensive testicle, $35,000 per testicle. I never knew that there was a study that did that. Not all studies are this dramatic. A lot of them are more for medications that are well known, well tolerated, just kind of comparing different patient populations. That's why I recommend everyone visit clinicaltrials.gov to learn more. Mark participates in so many clinical trials that he gets free checkups every month to see if he's a good candidate for each study. So a checkup that's seeing if you're a good candidate doesn't always mean that you're getting a good checkup, a good preventive visit. During a visit, you don't just get a checkup, you also get active risk assessment and then advice on those risks. So this isn't a replacement for a checkup. So what I'd like for you to do is take off your shirt. Okay. And I'll come back in and uh, we'll do a brief exam. Okay. Okay, and also, I gotta check out your gyms. Okay. So we'll <laughs> take a look at that too. See, I like that the doctor is laying out exactly what's gonna happen during the visit before doing it, because I see a lot of uh, young doctors and older doctors are like rushing through these procedures, not getting the patient enough time to mentally prepare, to physically prepare for what's gonna happen, whatever the exam might be. Being a lab rat, you have to be very healthy. Your labs have to be in certain ranges and levels, in a healthy level, to be a healthy control. When he says a healthy control, that means he's probably in the group that's being held at a constant and not be given the experimental treatment. The thing is, with randomized controlled studies, which is the gold standard of scientific evidence, you wanna be blinding not just the researchers, but also the patients, meaning not knowing who's getting the true treatment and who's in the control arm. So in a double blind study, he wouldn't know if he's in the control group or not. Your heart sounds regular, and I don't hear extra beats. So what we're listening, when we listen with the stethoscope to the heart, you wanna make sure that the, the rate is consistent, not too fast, not too slow. It has to be a regular rate, not irregular. That could be a sign of an arrhythmia, like AFib is a common one, atrial flutter is another. But then you're also listening for the flow of blood. That's when we can detect something known as a murmur, which is how blood flows through the different chambers of the heart or different arteries. And when we hear certain sounds, th that murmur, depending on which location we hear it, where it, it's most intense, we can then decide the area that we're most concerned about. So like all these things need to be taken into consideration. And then we can order further testing like an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart to visualize exactly what we're going on. And usually if you're really good with the stethoscope, you can predict what you're gonna see on an EKG or an echocardiogram because it's a great tool. Drop your drawers okay. and we just kind of you know, examine both testicles. We rub them between our two fingers. You want to use more medical terminology rather than layperson terminology because that can make people feel uncomfortable. When you're doing it, you also want to visualize the area. So a lot of the times I see on these shows, they're doing stuff like this. Like they're almost looking up and not looking at the region that they're making contact with. Then you could miss all sorts of rashes, hair conditions, masses that you might see with your vision, not uh, with your touch. Overall, it's an incomplete physical exam in my eyes. Low testosterone levels affect roughly 39% of men. A low test result for Mark would take him out of the running for the testicular study. The risk to you is, is pretty significant. I'm not endorsing the surgery. Mark's test results are well below the acceptable range set for the clinical trial. When you're seeing a primary care doctor like myself and you're going in for a preoperative clearance, we're not deciding if the surgery is right for you. We're deciding your risk for the procedure and if there's any way we can optimize your medical state or your health in order for you to have decreased likelihood of adverse effect effects from the surgery. Maybe 
going on testosterone replacement would be a great thing for you. Okay. Have you ever thought about doing that? Well, how about asking him if he has issues that could show that his low testosterone is clinically significant as opposed to just an asymptomatic lab finding? Like, an asymptomatic lab finding is not always necessary to be treated, especially men of an older age. Like, this is where you gotta be really careful with these hormone replacement clinics. And I'm not saying anything specifically about this one because this might not be showing the whole visit, but just in general to keep in, the, in your back of your mind. While it doesn't pay as much as the testicular removal study, Mark does manage to land a spot in a trial testing testosterone replacement. Each one of these pills represents to me a car insurance payment. $75 every Monday, cash, $50 every Tuesday, $125 a week, times four, $500 a month equals my rent and my car payment. Your rent and your car payment's 500 bucks? That's very reasonable. One of the main things that I look for when I go dumpster diving now are, are medications, especially prenatal vitamins. Okay, very dangerous, specifically when it comes to medications, because a lot of times medications are not in correct pill bottles and may not be labeled correctly, and therefore you may not know their expiration date or their dosage, and that presents a whole host of problems. I think expiration date in general are kind of mm. I'm not sure what she means by mm, but there is some truth to the fact that a good amount of the medications, if stored properly, if stored properly, if stored properly, could be good past their expiration date for a short period of time. And the reason why I say that is because there was actually a study done by the government to see that the medications that were stored in the military bases, they were stored in correct locations with the correct conditions. Five years after, some of them were still effective. And the ones that were expired past that time were just less effective. They kind of lost their efficacy. And you have to think as a doctor, when is that dangerous? That's dangerous if you're thinking about taking expired emergency medications like epinephrine, insulin. These are medications that if they're they're not effective, you're in danger. Taking an expired Tylenol, the real risk of it is that it might not work. But taking expired epinephrine when you're having an anaphylactic attack means that you can die. You see how there's a difference there? A lot of times they put expiration dates on things way earlier than they need to just to sell more products. That's not the case. It's done in a way that you need to understand common use. And when you think of common use, most people do not properly store their medications. They frequently store them in the bathroom, which is a high humidity environment, which is not good for any medication. Medications that are like in gels and in liquid form tend to be even short shorter expiration dates, meaning they're, they're good for a shorter period of time because they're more likely to go bad. Bingo. It's folic acid, which is good for pregnancy. I mean, folic acid is important for pregnancy. It's advised by the AFP and the CDC that individuals who are considering getting pregnant or are pregnant take 0.4 milligrams to 0.8 milligrams, which is 400 micrograms to 800 micrograms of folic acid as a way to decrease the likelihood of neurologic defects occurring during pregnancy. Every dollar we spend on anything other than food is a waste. Wow. I don't see the need to spend money on furniture. I'm a floor guy. I sit on the floor and it's very comfortable. I mean, to each their own, like this isn't a medical issue here. What I did was I found some two by fours and these are styrofoam peanuts. So I just take all the peanuts, throw them in there, and then I cover it up with bubble wrap. And then this is a tablecloth and it makes a perfect bed. I mean, I just don't know if I would go to say perfect bed. I could see a lot of those like foam peanuts move around and then as a result, you're laying on the hard floor and putting pressure on your shoulder that you could wake up with uh, quite the painful uh, rotator cuff or labrum. To find good roadkill on the road and if it's fresh, fresh, fresh and good, I'm a butcher, I have no problem whatsoever eating something that's fresh and good. I mean, this person's a butcher, so at least they have some experience on whether or not uh, certain foods are safe to eat. It doesn't seem ideal given that it's not controlled how these things die. Did a car run over it? Did it eat some poison, then die, then a car ran over it? You know what I'm saying? Tonight we're serving barbecued rabbit and a tossed salad made with flowers that we've gathered. I mean, you could just grow vegetables. <laughs> like you can go to an apple tree orchid and pull an apple off of it and eat it and know that it's an apple versus like, I can't even begin to guess the nutritional facts on a dandelion. It was weeds, all weeds, dandelions, flowers, clovers, things that you just don't normally eat. Yeah, again, I don't know the nutrition facts of those things, but it doesn't seem safe. Or necessary, that's the goal here. Wanted a little thing, a little discovery that I've made, a way to save on coffee. I enjoy my coffee in the morning. Mm, I have me too. made my own little coffee device out of an old sock. 
Like you couldn't use a shirt, you went for the sock? They uh, definitely ask for this on the show. I hear the producers already. He's like, I use a piece of cloth. They're like, can you use a sock? I developed a method with rubber bands to keep my soap levitated off of that water. It lets it dry, it prevents mildew, and my soap lasts double the amount of time it would normally last. I'm with it, another one that I'm with. I'm probably saving between 80 and $100 a year just on soap alone. I love it. You know, I think green tea is a really good drink. Click here to learn all about the potential benefits of green tea. And again, huge thank you to ButcherBox for sponsoring this video. As always, stay happy and healthy.